This is the liquid soap that I made. I would love to ask the internet if they can explain what's going on here. I did this in the same process that I would normally do a potassium hydroxide liquid soap. Potassium hydroxide is, is very uh, hygroscopic. It's going to pull moisture in out of the air. And it's going to change its, um, if what you're doing when you're making soap, you're measuring your ingredients based on weight. And if you're bringing in water, then you're going to increase the weight and you're going to throw off your values. When you're making liquid soap, remember when I said that if you want to make, um, like a lot of times, home soap makers are going to add a little bit of extra fat to their soaps. Um, when you're making liquid soaps, your fat is going to float to the top. And it's going to look, if there's excess fat, it's, you're, going to, you're going to see it in your liquid soap. And let me show you an example of an early soap that I made where there's still excess fat. I know that there's excess fat in this because it turns cloudy when it's cold, right? This will be as clear as this one if the temperature just gets up around, you know, 60 or 80. Um, this soap is the response to this one. Um, I know this is getting a little off topic, but I, I learned the method in scientific soap making on how to determine my alkalinity value and applied that to my old potassium hydroxide that the jar had been left open and it pulled in a bunch of moisture. And I was able to dial it in. I just needed to add about, um, I think, 10% more. Um, and that's in my notes about 10% more potassium hydroxide to get a fully saponified soap. So there's almost no extra fat in there. There might be some extra fat, but very little. And um, I can test um, for extra alkali just by measuring pH. Does that uh, one burn you? No, it doesn't. Yeah. No, this is like a, probably my best soap that I've made yet. Um, and uh, you know, make about six quarts at a time. When you're making liquid soap, you'll make a concentrate, and then you'll add water to it. And then you can make quite a bit of soap that way. It's nice. Yeah, a nice it's way good, to do it. It has a good consistency and color to it. Yeah, and it doesn't smell that bad. Considering this is made, um, technically these are, don't be scared of the word, these are rancid oils. Um, rancid doesn't mean that it's got like maggots coming out of it. It just means that it's um, old and, and already oxidized. oxidized. Yeah. And uh, given that, I really don't think it smells that bad. There's, that's two ingredients soap. It looks really good. That's olive oil and potassium hydroxide. No, it doesn't smell bad. Yeah, I think I've kind of learned to love that smell now. Is that the stuff you gave us? Pro I gave you, a, I had a bunch of samples for y'all to choose from. I think you took the, yeah, you took that, right? Have you used Virginia Washington? It's a good, yeah. that's a good earthy smell to it. So you could put your herbals in there to make it smell yeah. good. Yeah, add a little patchouli in your scent. There you go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, I tried to do a titration on my ash water using the same method. I thought, man, I was really successful with that. Let's try to apply that. Um, uh, I didn't really understand. I still don't really understand how that, um, it, it, exactly how. But uh, in, in doing my last minute research and throwing this together, um, I came across a group that um, I, I'm going to ex explore quite a bit more here. Um, a nonprofit called Beyond Benign that is um, introducing uh, green chemistry lesson plans to uh, high school and um, college coursework, uh, which I thought was pretty fascinating. Um, really talking about reuse, um, using waste materials, and um, uh, they've got it just cut and dry, how to titrate your ash water lye. And um, didn't get a chance to do that. It requires a different, uh, some, some different uh, reagents that I'll have to order and get those in-house. But, um, but that would be the bona fide way to, to learn exactly how to make liquid soap from wood ash. Here's what happened to mine. I did it all. I made the concentrate, and then I added the water to it, poured it into about five or six different jars. Those jars um, all had this stuff settle out over time, settle down to the bottom. Um, this jar was originally full, and it looked like a milky white solid, right? or milky white emulsion. And over time, every, this, this heavier stuff followed out to the bottom. And I just pulled out, with using my dropper or scoop, I pulled out the uh, clearish liquid that was floating on top. 
and I've just been storing it in these little jars. And um, this stuff is actually really good soap. It's really thin, but um, I don't know. Take a look at all this. It's in there. It's fantastic. Oh, I cheated a little bit too. Um, if you add a little bit of castor oil to your soap, you'll, you'll increase the suds amount, which is effectively useless, I think, for cleaning. But um, it's one of those, like, people expect suds. So if you put suds in. Um, Have you tried it on your laundry yet? No. I think this would probably be kind of a mess. The wood ash soap on my laundry would turn my clothes brown, I think. But um, you guys feel free to wash up. Take this soap and kind of play with it if you want to. Go over there to the sink and like see what it feels like. Um, <laughs> feel free to do some dishes. Your best soap. <laughs> <laughs> you need to wash the counter off. Right. Yeah, there's my liquid soap in action right there. That's washing my nishimol pot at home. Uh, a few things that I would like to explore further, uh, or I would like to see somebody explore further, um, uh, a more carefully designed refinement process. Um, maybe uh, introducing that in recipe format would be nice so that people can learn to start sourcing pure potash. Um, there's a lot of stuff online about applications in building materials. I'd really like to explore that further. Um, I did try a little wood ash mortar, and uh, it was moderately effective. It was, it was neat. Definitely getting that home alkalinity test figured out so that people can uh, really learn its potency in terms of food preparation. And, so, and then exploring the uh, calcium line a little bit more carefully. Um, I wanted to wrap up with um, showing an, a, a trial that I just have been doing over the past couple of days using crushed up um, eggshells and then putting them in a uh, little stainless steel vessel and covering them with coals at the end of my wood stove burn. I cover them with coals and bank them up front close to my wood stove and let uh, as much air blow across those coals and get just like glowing red hot and force air into it. And what I'm trying to do is oxidize the calcium carbonate and turn it into calcium oxide, which is quicklime, um, which then can be added to potash to create more potent alkali. That's how you source potassium hydroxide, um, is by adding quicklime to potash. You, you can read about that. Um, you can read about that in caveman chemistry, I believe. You can learn a lot of chemistry in that book. Have you come across any types of homemade filtration systems for water using? Yeah, we're going to do a workshop on that, a lot of the conventional homestead ways of doing it. And then um, I hope to explore, uh, I will be exploring, I don't know if we'll be successful with it, is a um, at-home activated carbon um, process. We know how to make charcoal. Let's see if we can come up with ways to activate it. Um, and using potash may be... Um, Central to that. Can I put my finger I'm put in, it in the main container. Yeah, you can put your finger in. Sure. Yeah, that's good soap. Okay, so <laughs> I know there's a lot there, and it can be a little bit intimidating. Um, and um, don't feel bad if you don't want to go home and like do all kinds of crazy experiments with your ash. Here's what I would do: if you just want to be a responsible ash owner, um, is um, store your ashes and know that they're fully extinguished, right? Know that they're fully extinguished. Spread them thinly on the forest floor. Um, they might, you know, could burn leaves, so don't cast them high up in the air. But spread them thinly on the forest floor, away from waterways, and essentially you're giving back to the trees what they pulled out and gave to you. Uh, just don't start a forest fire. Okay. If you do need to quench it, try to just quench it lightly because you want to give that potassium back as well. Right? Any questions? Thank you for sticking with it. Um, appreciate it. I know that went a little long. So. All right. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you.